This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome to Heard Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. It's Friday, folks. You made it to the end of yet another week. Uh, glad you're joining us on this March 18th year of our Lord 2022 continues to roll along. Spring starts to bloom out a little bit. Uh, spring break coming up for a lot of folks. Hope you're happy and well wherever you are across the street or around the world. A couple of different things we want to get to today on the program. Uh, Vice President Harris, uh, more calm resets, more things going on in her office. We're going to talk a little domestic politics. The vice president once again reshuffling things, what that means. We'll get into that a little bit later on in the program. Uh, some interesting numbers out of a YouGov poll, how people perceive things. How do they perceive minorities? How do they perceive cities? How do they perceive political parties and political issues? And they did it a little bit different way. They did a gap range between what the number really is and what people think it is. And people's perceptions and assumptions come to find out, shockingly, are way off sometimes. We'll get into that turn the noise down on that in a little bit. Uh, also, to end the program today, uh, cool story over in England. Guy went out for a midnight smoke, saw some flame in the sky, thinks it was a meteorite. And maybe it was what he was smoking, but if it is a meteorite, it might be worth six figures worth of money. Big deal. We'll get to that story. Our guest today, tough topic, but it's an important topic. Uh, Regan Farrell, a Young Voices contributor, contributor with Old Pros Network. We're going to talk a little sex work and human trafficking, and regulation, and decriminalization, and legalization, and issues like this. Why do we delve into those issues? They're tough issues. They're sticky issues. People recoil from them, but it's important to talk about them because what happens with things like sex workers and people like that is law enforcement, when they go to encroach on rights, they usually use things like sex work, and they'll talk about things like human trafficking, whether it exists or not, and we'll get into that a little bit, how big of a problem that really is, to justify things like budgets and arrests and things like this. But the thing is, rights have to apply to everyone, or they're not really rights. And just because you slap the word sex worker on somebody doesn't mean they don't have rights anymore. This is where the creeping edge of criminal justice and the law and people's rights start to interact, and it's a place we need to talk about. It's a tough topic, but we're going to have an adult grown folk conversation about it. Might challenge some of your thinking on it. Uh, so we'll get with Regan Farrell from Young Voices as our guest today. But first, let's start over in Russia, Vladimir Putin. Um, this is from The Telegraph, but this has been covered in multiple media outlets now. Uh, it came out. We kind of left it alone the first day that these comments came out uh, because we wanted to make sure uh, that we had the comments accurately portrayed. We've covered this before when it comes to Vladimir Putin, that all you got to do is listen to him and believe him. I understand we're working through translators here, but we have good high quality translations available. 
Um, here comes the crackdown. We already covered last week that he had started to do some arrests inside the intelligence uh, apparatus that he has. Clearly, we have um, really good intelligence on this. We've got people inside. He's hunting them down. Now he's going to punish everybody else for it. Uh, one of Moscow's most senior military commanders was arrested on Thursday. This is from the Telegraph UK. After Vladimir Putin promised to, quote, purify Russia. Listen to this language. Believe what this man is saying purify Russia of traitors in a sign of, quote, real discord in the Kremlin over the war, according to the British minister. It came as U.S. intelligence said at least 7,000 Russian troops have been killed in the Ukraine, including three top generals with up to 21,000 soldiers injured and maybe more. Uh, the only estimate that the Kremlin has released is in like 480 some, and that was a couple of weeks ago. That conservative estimate, back to the Telegraph, is greater than the number of American troops killed over 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan combined. That's a right around 4,000. The losses appear to be leading to a purge of Putin's top military and intelligence commanders, including General Roman Garovoy. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, uh, the deputy head of Russian National Guard on Thursday. Increasingly isolated and angry, the Russian president this week used a TV appearance to lash out at, quote, traitors. Listen to these quotes. Believe what this evil man is telling us. Quote, the Russian people are able to distinguish between true patriots and scum and traitors and simply spit them out like flies that flew into their mouths, Putin told an online meeting of the Russian cabinet. Quote, this is Putin. I am convinced that a natural and necessary self-purification of society will strengthen our country. I'm going to repeat that. Listen to this man's words. I am convinced that a natural and necessary self-purification of society will strengthen our country. This is World War II Nazi Germany type rhetoric coming from a man who has a hundred thousand plus troops in the field waging a war of aggression right now. He's going to purify his own society. He's going to purify his own people. I will remind us, this is a man who poisons journalists publicly. He uses a specific nuclear poison on dissidents and, jur and journalists and public figures trying to assassinate and or silence them publicly so that they know that it was him that ordered it. This is a man who brutalizes his own people, who has brutalized Georgia, who has brutalized Chechnya, who has brutalized and annexed the Crimea. And he has gone into Syria with his partner, the butcher Assad, and leveled entire cities and done all the tactics that we're seeing in Ukraine right now, plus others, things like chemical weapons in Syria. And the world didn't do a whole lot to stop him. And now in his bunker mentality, he's lashing out. He's doing a purge. There's another story about how he got rid of his top 1,000 staffers. Man has a 1,000 staffers. He got rid of all of them. You see him in these things where he's at the long tables. Nobody's ever near him. He's clearly in a bunker mentality, in stage dictator stuff. And now he wants to purify his own people of wrong think, of traitors. This man is capable of desperate and horrible things. I don't know how Ukraine's going to go, although the bravery of the Ukrainian people has stymied his ambition so far. But this is a man who is openly telling us that there are no rules when it comes to what he wants to do. Purify people? We talk about things like what happened in World War II, like the Holocaust. And we can go back further, even in Ukraine, the whole little mayor, where they starved millions of people to death on purpose. When you have a dictator as evil and wicked as Vladimir Putin, and he starts talking about purifying his own society, you better watch out because he's telling you human life means nothing to him and nothing to his ambitious. And this is a man that is capable of anything. We better decide real quick what our red lines are and what our calls to action are. Because Vladimir Putin is straight telling us he doesn't care about anything and anyone outside of his own power. Purify people? That is rhetoric from the worst parts of human history. And we better mark it now and not be surprised when he goes to act on it. More her tell right after this. Hi, welcome back to Hertel. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Let's go to some domestic politics real quick. Uh, specifically, 
Let's talk about our vice president, uh, Vice President Harris, back in the news. Uh, this is from Politico's playbook. Uh, Alex Thompson, Max Tani did this particular edition of it. Uh, vice President Kamala Harris press shop overhaul is almost complete. Now, this is just real quick. This is like the third or fourth time we've done a comms overhaul for the vice president's office in the year or so that she's been in office. Um, kind of surprising. Uh, after months filled with tough headlines, Harris's communication director left in November and then her press secretary departed in December. Now, Deputy Press Secretary Sabrina Singh is leaving for the Defense Department, the vice president's office confirmed. Of the four most senior communication officials that began with Vice President Harris, only one, Herb Zinnick, uh, remains. The departures and their replacements amount to Harris resetting her press team under new comms director Jamal Simmons. Uh, Ziskin, the deputy communication director who has close ties to the West Wing, after previous stints working for Ron Klain, that's the chief of staff for the president, at Revolution LLC, Anita Dunn at SKDK, and Joe Biden, when he was vice president, will be promoted to senior advisor for communications. Press Secretary Rachel Palomero, who was on the transition team, and Pete Buttigieg's presidential campaign is being promoted to the deputy comms director. Uh, Ernesto Arpriza, the White House senior advisor for public engagement, is moving over to the press team as the new deputy press secretary. He was also Nevada State Director on Harris's presidential campaign and Deputy Communication Director in Colorado for Hillary Clinton 2016 campaign, where White House Political Director Emily Ruiz was State Director. Of course, all these folks know each other. These are all you know insular things. They're all friends. Finally, Tate Mitchell, another alum of Harris's presidential campaign, recently joined the office from the Small Business Administration to be Press Operations Coordinator. Here's the important part. With the new arrivals, departures, and promotions have come a gradually shifting strategy as well. Harris has been doing more national media interviews um, at the one-year mark of the administration, and after the State of the Union, she did ABC, NBC, and CBS morning shows, a trifecta Biden often did as vice president as well. She also sat down with PBS NewsHour, Face the Nation, and Telemundo. We call this the car wash, where you do all the network shows all at once. And after stumbles, like when she told Craig Melvin about their COVID-19 strategy that, quote, it's time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. <laughs> That's some good wordy word that says nothing, ain't it, folks? Uh, Harris continues to do more interviews to try to move on to the next cycle instead of retreating or becoming more risk averse. She has also tried to get help in the mix on issues outside her given portfolio, such as her recent trips to Europe, the discussion in the war between Russia and Ukraine. The reset isn't fully over either. A White House official says Harris is also hiring a new press secretary. What does this all mean? Well, we constantly seem to be rebooting, re-imaging, re-strategizing the vice president. There's a couple things here. One is the premise that you're going to have a high-profile vice president. It's a little problematic in the first place because by nature, they're always going to be overshadowed by the actual president. Uh, the vice president doesn't really have a lot of official roles, has almost no power over presiding over the Senate, which is just a tie-breaking vote and otherwise is ceremonial. Obviously, the folks in the Democratic Party and in the uh, Harris camp want her to have a high profile for her own future ambitions. They're finding out what a lot of people have found out before. It's hard being a vice president because there's no real way to do it without overshining the actual president. And then it's a tricky thing because you don't want to look like you're trying to hot dog or upstage the main boss. But at the same time, you're trying to get your little bit of spotlight. Also, let's back up a little bit. And remember why she's vice president in the first place. Uh, she did not do well in her presidential primary, despite a lot of establishment backing, despite really great fundraising. She didn't even make it to Iowa. So the idea that she is going to be some kind of special for folks doesn't have any data to back it up yet. Now, she may do that down the road somewhere. But for now, the person that she works for ostensibly, Joe Biden, already reaches all those communities that they keep saying that she would be the perfect outreach to. They ran, not walk to him. So let's watch the hype on Vice President Harris. She is what she is. We have data points on it. And despite any time they kind of have to reboot over and over and over again, the problem probably isn't us. The problem's probably her. And it'll bear watching. More her tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, touchy topic. We're going to do what we always do, though. We're going to skip the caterwauling. We're going to turn down the noise. We're going to get to some actual facts. Uh, Regan Farrell is joining us. Uh, impressive resume for her, formerly with Cato. She's with All Pro Productions. She's also with the Narrative Project. You know how big of fans we are of that because they do what we do. They just get to the data and let you make up your own mind. Uh, Regan, how you doing? I'm doing really well. Great to be here. Thank you so much for the time. Okay, 
when we just announce this topic, people kind of get a strong reaction. So I'm going to start out by explaining why we talk about this particular problem at hand. Um, People will roll their eyes or they have their preconceived notions about sex workers. But the way we're going to address it today is if you're concerned about criminal justice, if you're concerned about social justice, if you're concerned about people's rights, this is the bleeding edge of how sometimes the police and the criminal justice system start getting their mission creep into people's rights. And they do it under the banner of, well, they're sex workers and they're sex trafficking, these things. And then the rights start going to, to the wayside because the buzzwords have more power than the rights. And that's the backwards way to do it. That's really the issue at hand below the nomenclature that kind of freaks people out, isn't it? It certainly is. Sex workers are often the canaries in the coal mine when it comes to different contentious issues. Um, that can be criminal justice. It can be um, online with CDA 230 and FOSTA-SESTA. Often we see content removed that's sexual in nature before we see anything else salacious. And it happens with um, cryptocurrency as well. Sex workers were early adopters of crypto, of Ethereum, of Bitcoin, because they are always incentivized to try out new financial structures. And you first see um, regulation occurring to sex workers before you see it happen more broadly. And since you brought it up, let's do this for by way of background. You talked about FOSTA. Uh, this had wide ranging effects that I think a lot of people, even very online people probably don't realize. Uh, I can remember 10, 12 years ago, I was living in Vegas when Red Book went down. That was a huge issue. Uh, everybody probably more familiar maybe with Craigslist. We're starting to date ourselves, but imagine Craigslist being out of date, but it is. Uh, Craigslist went through this issue. Red Book went through this issue. Even the big giants like Facebook and Twitter have had to answer questions about this, especially Twitter, because they actually allow adult content. These things like the FOSTA thing, it was done under the guise of cracking down on sex workers and sex trafficking, but it really affected almost everybody's internet, didn't it? It changes the landscape entirely. And you still see um, FOSTA SESTA cases coming through. You're going through the back, tri back page trial right now. It restarted on February 22nd, and you're seeing um, the Earn It Act go through legislation currently, which is just a further curve out of CDA 230, internet regulation, content moderation. And like I said, I, help me with the dates here. Red Book, that was, God, 10, 12 years ago now, probably. And yes, the, and it was 2012, 2013. Yeah. And those folks are just now getting their trial stuff. Um, they really went after those folks basically because they said, do this, do this. And they said, no, we're not going to do it. Um, we've seen the government do this with the IRS. We've seen them do it with prosecutors. They're doing it with the Internet now and they're using sex work and human trafficking as the guys. But in the case of the Red Book now, they're getting retried because it turns out that wasn't the case at all, was it? No. And in the case of Backpage, they were actually working with the DOJ. They ran all of their images through um, the missing persons database for the DOJ. They worked with local precincts and officers in order to find trafficking victims. Um, and these, these websites that have sprung up in place of Backpage have actually have no agreement with local police officers, and it's become more difficult to find trafficking victims. They have to resort to the traditional method, which is asking on the street. Yeah, which we know how that goes because now you're <laughs> having police interactions and we know how those can go sometimes. Uh, Certainly. Regan Farrell joining us on her tell. All right. I'm just going to throw you the question before we dig into the issue, the pushback. Well, it is illegal. So why do I care? It is illegal, but I try to begin with a harm reduction framework there. Um, if your main issue is helping victims of helping people get out of something that you feel is immoral or is threatening them, then I completely understand. But the best way to do so is decriminalizing sex work. Then you're not bothering anyone who, out of their own volition, has engaged in this or needs to engage in this work in order to provide for their family. Sex work is often referred to as a victimless crime. Um, it's not so dissimilar to other things that are completely legal, such as selling your plasma. Uh, we can have a longer debate about the ethics of work and labor if we want to, but that's um, not for today. But a lot of people will take jobs that they don't either care about or are actively destructive to them. Um, I think of my father working in factories his entire life who is not able to stand up straight anymore. And so when you're talking about sex, it's often because people feel some sort of way about the morality. And that's why it's criminalized. Yeah. Now, let's get some nomenclature done. There is a difference between decriminalizing it 
and making it completely legal. There's a little bit of a nuance there, just so everybody has the nomenclature right. What's the difference between legalizing it and decriminalizing it? This is language we hear with uh, marijuana a lot of the times. We've seen it with gambling now, where gambling has gone mainstream. Uh, just give folks the nuance of that a little bit of what exactly we're talking about here, because it, it comes off like we're going to have societal approval of something, and that's not exactly what we're talking about here. It's not tacit approval. Um, decriminalizing sex work is preferred by sex workers because it doesn't hold a criminal penalty. Legalization often looks like um, what's available in Reno, Nevada, for example, which is just a state-owned monopoly. It imposes harsh regulations. Sex workers there are only able to work in the state-owned brothels. They're not allowed to work as independent contractors. And they actually turn over about 50% of their wages to the, the pimps, the brothel owners in that system. Decriminalization allows sex workers to operate as independent contractors, form their own coalitions, um, really work out what they want to and make their own hours. Now, over in Europe, because uh, I lived in Germany uh, two different times, over in Europe, other parts of the world, this is already kind of the standard. And yet somehow their societies have not completely collapsed into burning piles of nothingness. Um, I'm being a little facetious because... Again, I understand this is icky to people. I understand a lot of people have a moral problem with it, but they call this the world's oldest profession for a reason. Human nature is undefeated. Uh, some of this is us beating our heads against the wall against something that's going on, and we just don't seem to want to have a realistic conversation about it, do we? No, not at all. This is going to continue happening. You're not going to see the oldest profession um, immediately cave in the moment that you have criminalized it, you haven't, it still continues in the, the shadows and it, it's just really dangerous for the people involved. So this goes back to what we were talking about, harm reduction. You're not going to take somebody that's working on the street or out of a hotel room or whatever stereotype you have in your head about sex work. You're not going to take them from zero to getting a college education and a, and a middle-class job. That doesn't go from zero to 60. So like we've seen, again, I hate to use the examples, but people understand, um, things with legalizing drugs and drug reduction and drug harm reduction, gambling is another example. If we're going to have good policy in these fields, even if you're dead set against them, there's a reality here of, hey, these people can't go from zero to 60 to doing it to dead stop. You've got to have some middle grounds and some steps involved, don't you? Entirely. Um, often human trafficking victims first experience the police is in handcuffs, not as they're being helped. And it's incredibly difficult for a lot of these human trafficking victims, once it's discovered that they're victims to overturn their convictions. And you can imagine um, a world where sex work is decriminalized and there is no record. And so this person is found out to be a victim. They receive resources, help, job training, and they're not spending all of their hard earned cash trying to overturn a conviction that is wrongly imposed upon them. We've seen it in other areas of the criminal justice system, especially on the, what we call the low end, which we probably shouldn't refer to at that end. But, you know, the petty crime end, things like this. This is really a situation, you know, again, like drug use, like recreational drug use. We seem to be making more criminals than we actually seem to be doing anything about actual crime, don't we? We certainly do. Uh, you're hearing pushes for something called the end demand model, which sex workers advocate against. This criminalizes the client, but not the worker. In practice, this happens in um, Amsterdam, for example. In practice, this actually just drives the transaction further underground because sex workers will work to protect their money, their transaction, and their client. Um, you have a very traditional sort of leaning in the window, saying hello, offering the prices. This can't happen under the end-demand model because you have to speed up the entire transaction. The client is often anxious of getting arrested, and so instead... The worker will just hop in the car and then they have to negotiate once they're already in the car. They can't assess the situation before they're engaging. Yeah. And you can imagine how that power structure goes if you get a bad somebody with bad intentions in a big hurry. We're talking to Regan Farrell, uh, Young Voices contributor, also does some other work with things like Old Pro Foundation. We're going to come back after the break. We're going to actually back up what we're saying with some criminal stats, the police themselves tell you why this model does not currently work. And we're going to use an example everybody's aware of. We just had it last month, the Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl for football is also the Super Bowl for not only sex work stereotypes, but sex works conspiracy theories. We're going to get into that a little bit of human trafficking. More with Reagan Farrell right after this. I 
Hi, welcome back to Herd Tell. Regan Farrell is still joining us from Young Voices, talking about a touchy topic, but one we got to talk about because it gets to the heart and the core of things like rights and criminal justice and women's issues that we try to talk about a lot. Okay, the Super Bowl is the biggest event in America. It's the most watched television show every single year. Uh, as many as maybe a third of all Americans bet on it, as many as half of Americans watched it. But it's also the Super Bowl for sex work, sex works dialogue, and human trafficking conspiracy theories, isn't it? Yes, it is. You also hear these conspiracy theories around um, events like WrestleMania or when the Olympics is in the United States, the NBA championships. Um, but really any major sporting event, and certainly the Super Bowl, turns out police officers um, looking for human trafficking victims, it's usually a, an easy win for them in order to find, um, it, it's less so about the sex worker or the prostitution itself, and it's more about combating human trafficking, that sort of narrative. You hear these wild statistics that thousands of young girls, thousands of people are being trafficked in for these major events, which is patently false. It's typically um, local sex workers coming in for business. Um, there are pimps, there are abusers. That's not to say that there are no trafficking victims that are saved, rescued from these stings, but it just ends up hurting more people than it's helping. And if you work together with sex workers in order to identify victims, you could do so in a manner that's ruining more people's lives than it's saving. Yeah. And we have actually stats to back this up. It's really funny. You wrote about it in your piece in Counterpunch, which everybody should go read, counterpunch.org. Um, in the last three years, the grand total of minors rescued from human trafficking at the Super Bowl is 11. Now, yes. we're glad for those 11. Uh, if you want to get down on underage trafficking, I'm all for it. Everybody agrees that's one of the worst of human uh, crimes that you can commit on somebody else. So we want to oh, rid everything of that. But the thing is, is these idea that there's thousands of these, and therefore we're going to crack down on everybody that um, you made the exception. Let's just get into it here because this is the segue. Um, California, where the Super Bowl was held, was in LA, SoFi Stadium, beautiful venue. But they have these loitering laws where if you're dressed a certain way and have a condom in your purse, they're going to harass you as a woman. That's a far cry from thousands of people being underage sex trafficking to now we're just going to harass citizens that their skirts too short. That's a bad, dangerous road to let law enforcement go down, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's not often that I'm able to be vindicated like this. There were 494 total arrests at the Super Bowl and 82 total rescues, what they're listed as rescues. If you'd like to see it, you can go look at the L.A. County Sheriff Department's write-up of this event. They call it Operation Reclaim and Rebuild. Um, so 494 total arrests, 214 of those are listed as commercial consensual adult sex workers. 201 are listed as sex buyers. 53 are listed as pimps, panders, or supervisors. And 26 are other related um, felonies, charges, and offenses. And one note on the pimp, pander, and supervisor. You don't actually have to be exploitative in that. Say one sex worker is helping another um, to place an ad, to find a client, is acting as a bodyguard, or just knows where the, um, the sex worker is taking their client. They can be charged with pimping and pandering because they are overseeing the act. It doesn't actually prove that there's any violence or exploitation. 82 total rescued, um, 74 are adults and eight are juveniles. Eight juveniles, obviously that's a horrible thing, but eight is not thousands. And no. when they go back and do these things, uh, you actually laid it out. Um, this is a habit, Atlanta in 2019, nine alleged juvenile sex trafficking victims, Miami in 2020, one 17 year old girl, uh, Tampa in 2021, six people believed to be victims of human trafficking. These are just the arrests though, when you go to do the follow-up, and it's too early probably for the for the LA Super Bowl, but when you go to do the follow-up into these things, do these charges actually end up panning out in a lot of cases? Some do, certainly. Um, in Tampa, the six people, the one, one of them was a 17-year-old girl, the other five were adults. And that trafficking a lot of times looks more like domestic violence than it does um, some international cartel or what we think of when we're watching TV or in, we hear in the media sometimes. It's not some coordinated effort. It's usually an older boyfriend pressuring their 
girlfriend or fiance or wife into making some extra cash on the side because they have um, an addiction or another issue or they like to exploit people. So when we have conspiracy theories and we try to figure out where they come from, obviously people have an ick factor with sex work. We've established that. So what's the other angle? Well, I always like to follow the money. Uh, one of the linked pieces from your piece is ProPublica Pro uh, Research. They use New York City as an example. The Super Bowl has a massive security apparatus for good reason. It would be a high profile target. You have lots and lots of law enforcement. You also have lots and lots of law enforcement that are working. They're making money. They're getting federal grants usually for a big event like the Super Bowl. They're getting extra funding. And this ProPublica report out of New York City, they have police officers, some retired, some active on background, openly saying, yeah, when we want some overtime, let's go round up some quote unquote sex workers because there's our eight hours right there just doing the paperwork for rounding them up. Regardless of whether they have a crime on record, regardless of whether they actually get charged down the road or whatever, this is a very bad way of doing policing in general. And specifically, if you're targeting women and people like this, that and in the ProPublica thing, it's almost all minorities and other groups like that. So between 2016 and 2020, nearly everyone arrested, it's 99.5% arrested in, by the NYPD um, for selling sex is a person of color. 99 Primarily, point what? Point five. It's wow. nearly everyone arrested by the NYPD was a person of color, primarily black people. Um, and there are actually loitering laws in New York as well. Um, those are, police often use racial, sexual, economic stereotypes based off of how the person is dressed, whether their skirt is too short or if they're just wearing a crop top. Um, if their hair is a certain way, if they're wearing heels, or if they are the wrong kind of person in a certain part of town. And I say that with parentheses around wrong kind of person, but that is the, the judgment call that these police are making. And certainly if they have a condom in their purse, or if they are, for whatever reason, not wearing underwear, or if they just look uh, provocative in any way, they can essentially perform a stop and frisk for sex workers. There are often people who don't have the means in order to um, overturn a conviction if it gets that far, or maybe they're working multiple jobs. They have um, an unusual schedule, and so they forget to show up for their court appearance. They can't hire anybody but a public defender. And so this person is now in the system. And once you have a criminal record like that, a lot of people, even if they hadn't engaged in sex work before, now engage with it because they are out of other options in order to make an income. Yeah. And this goes back to what we talked about before, where you start making more criminals than you are defeating crime. Uh, what's some of the answers here? We talked about the loitering laws. Uh, we understand the stereotypes. You're not going to be able to really do a whole lot about those because human nature is undefeated, as we always say on this program. But there is some legislative stuff. There is some policy stuff. And part of it just goes with starting with people who actually know what they're talking about and not so much on law enforcement who use this. Let's just call it what it is. This is an important part of their income stream. Uh, how do we get some other voices in here and policy-wise start trying to address this where it actually helps people and not just the power structures in the system? One of the best things that you can do is listen to sex workers, listen to human trafficking victims, listen to people who have been in this. Often these decisions are, are made without any input from people who have actually been in this sort of system or engaged with this work, whether it's people who are doing it consensually or not. Um, repealing in California, it's um, loitering laws through Senate Bill 357 would be a great start. Le repealing the loitering laws in New York would be another great start. You're seeing the uh, New York City Attorney General beginning to discuss this. Ultimately, decriminalizing sex work would be the right harm reduction framework in order to prevent a lot of these making more criminals, prevent the issues that we're seeing arise. So looping back to where we started, though, that's not possible if you're not able, if law enforcement and the criminal justice system isn't able to discuss things with these people in a productive way, because right now it's so adversarial that, you know, they're, they're rightfully concerned about just getting arrested for no reason. There's no communication involved. A lot of this is just going to really rely on getting good information. To be fair to the police officers in the criminal justice system, they've got to have good information to work off of. And they can't get that because of some of the legal barriers put in place at the moment. Oh, certainly. Police have an, a very difficult job. There's tons of incentives of why a victim might 
um, accept a charge out of fear of retribution from a pimp, or that a consensual adult sex workers may claim that they're victims to evade a criminal charge. There are tons of perverse incentives. By decriminalizing sex work, law enforcement officers can know who's in their community, know who are the, the normal people that are on the street or who are providing these services. They'll have their contacts. They can go in and ask have there been any red flags? Is there anybody new or out of town? Does something, is something setting off the bells and whistles in your head? And should we go check it out? You aren't bothering the people who are doing this consensually. You know that they're there. You're working within your community. And then you're also able to rescue victims. Once the threat of losing custody of your children or receiving criminal charge or being faced with fines, even if you don't have a record, you can still receive a number, a number of fines or spend a night in jail. Once the fear of the police is gone, you can work within the community in order to help who are who are truly the most at need here, the victims. Yeah, talking to Regan Farrell. Uh, she's the ops manager for Old Pro Incorporated. Uh, and she's also a Young Voices contributor. Uh, there's a thing that I've talked to with our legal friends and lawyer friends. It's become a real thing the last 15, 20 years. Uh, they call it the CSI effect, where like every jury thinks that, you know, you get DNA and because of the TV show CSI, criminal justice is really, really easy. Has there been kind of a law and order SVU thing to some of this where we we have a not good pop culture view of what are and are not victims here? And that is maybe warping how we view this because people think the victims are really clear cut. And like we've already detailed, when you have the system itself making more victims where otherwise they would not be, this gets really complicated really quick, doesn't it? Oh, certainly. And each story is different. You have people engaging with sex work who are technically doing it consensually, but um, we call it survival sex work. They have no other options. And so those are people we don't want in the system as well, who are um, who we want to provide options for direct aid resources in order to leave the industry. Um, you do have, like I said, mentioned before, perverse incentives on why people might claim that they're a victim when they're not, or take a criminal charge when they are a victim. Um, really, each individual case is needing and deserving of its own attention, and decriminaliz decriminalization allows for that. Regan Farrell, uh, a lot of heavy stuff. Grown folk talk on a really tough topic. We sure appreciate it. Uh, hopefully folks will at least, they don't have to reconsider their position, but at least maybe look at it from a different angle and make sure they're on the right side of these really, really tough issues. Let folks know about your social media, what you got going on with Old Pro uh, Incorporated, these things so they can find you and continue to follow your work. Certainly. You can go to uh, oldprosonline.org. We have multiple podcasts, one that's based on history, another called Old Pro News, which is topical debates on what's happening in sex work um, communities. And then you can also follow me on Twitter at Actual Webutant, A-C-T-U-A-L-W-E-B-U-T-A-N-T-E. Yep. And for those of you watching on YouTube or Facebook, that's on her lower third graphic. If you can't spell that fast, I know I can't. So you can follow her on Twitter as well. Uh, Regan Farrell, thank you so much for the time. I got a feeling this is probably going to keep popping up in the news from time to time. We'll definitely have you back on as it arises. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, ma'am. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. You know, our thing here is turning down the noise of the news cycle. We get to the information. We don't just go off half cocked about things. We dig into it. We find out what's actually going on. We don't react to the news. We try to understand the news and discern our time. And we have to do that with data sometimes. Interesting data points here from YouGov America. Polling came out. This got a lot of traction on social media. I don't know if you saw it or not. Uh, you can find it at YouGov.com. It's Y-O-U-G-O-V. Um, headline to the poll, Americans overestimate the size of minority groups and underestimate the size of most majority groups. Now, this goes to things like prejudices, stereotypes, things like this. We always say on this program, don't assume, find out. Uh, use that magical Google machine for something other than finding out, you know, which actor or actress was in your movie or whatever else you're trying to find out. And use the Internet for something other than sharing cat pictures and yelling at Washington or your politicians of your choice. Uh, 
instead of just working off your assumptions, you can actually find out data almost instantly. Google is an amazing thing, but it's also a self-participatory thing. Listen to some of these numbers. What they did was they gave you a range between the true portion or what it actually is and the estimated portion. And so it's the percentage of how far they're off. They're off by 10 points, 20 points, whatever scale one to a hundred, right? Uh, interesting things here. Uh, have a household income over 1 million, 0% true to 20% estimated portion. Over 20% of people thought there was more million dollar homes than there actually were. Uh, how many people are Muslim? 27 points off from what is the actual truth. How many people are Native American? 27% off. Jewish, 27% off. This is an interesting one. How many people live in New York City? You, how big do you think New York City is? Because, of course, New York City is overly represented in our media because it's very media centric. Over 30 per points off. People thought New York City was bigger than what it was. Uh, atheists, 33% off. Uh, bisexual, 29% off. Uh, members of a union. We just did this with our friend Dennis Saunders. If you missed that episode, go back and watch it talking about union labor. Union labor is down to about 10% of the American workforce. But when they ask this question here about are in a union, interesting number. Uh, the true portion is about 4% of respondents got it right. 36 points off. People thinking more people are in a union than they weren't. How about this one? Uh, the food one, we always talk about food, vegan or vegetarian. People were 30% off thinking there was 30% more vegan and vegetarians than there actually are. Uh, opposite of New York City, how many people live in Texas? They were 30% off on that one, too. Here's an offhanded one. Left-handed folk. Uh, interesting story. My father was actually ambidextrous till his one-room schoolhouse took a ruler to him. Uh, Left-handed folk, 34% off. Interesting number. And then there's some things that are really important here. Uh, have an advanced degree. 12% to 37% range off what people think than the actual numbers. First generation immigrants, 14% is the true portion. 33% was the estimated portion. Uh, how many people are Hispanic? Almost 40 points off the actual thing. How many people are Catholic? 41 points off. And then the widest range on the entire survey. Listen to this one. Who owns a gun in America? Gun ownership's a big topic. Second Amendment folks, very loud and online. People that are against gun ownership in various forms to various degrees, very loud online. 54% spread off of the mean of how many people own a gun in America. Here's another one. College degree, 47% off to 33% off. Uh, household income over 100000 This one was one of the tightest ones, 34% was the uh, true portion to 38%, the estimated portion. Uh, and how many people are Democrats? 42% 51. They did pretty well on that. And how many people in America? Um, this is one that uh, probably needs more delved into. How many people are a military veteran? 40% off. A lot of people think there's more veterans than there are. Uh, there's not only a very small single digit portion of the American community is in the military. The uh, depend, direct dependent one is in the low double digits. A very small portion carries the military burden for our country, unlike in a lot of other countries. So what does all this mean? Well, it means discernment is still the currency of the day. Don't just guess. If you know something or you're wondering about something, don't work off what you think you know. Go find out for sure. A lot of these are hot button topics, but they're also data points underneath. So when we talk about Hispanic folks like we have on this program lately, uh, if you're talking about Catholic folks, if you're talking about California, you're talking about New York City. If you're not in one of those groups, go find out about it before you start spouting off online and know what you're talking about. It's not that hard. You hold in your hand if you have a smartphone and we see the data, something like 89% of y'all that are watching her tell or listening right now are on your smartphones. Uh Use it for something good. Find out the actual information. Let that guide your hot takes and your opinions and the things you say online and work off of facts. It's something we try really hard to do here. Sometimes we're right. Sometimes we're wrong, but we always try to get the facts right. Do that because if you work off of assumptions, well, you know the old saying, if we had a whiteboard or chalkboard, we could write it out for you, but you get the idea. Don't assume things. Know the facts of the case and then go and opine on it. It'll make for a better discourse, make you look smarter, and it'll be better for everybody involved. 
More Herd Tell right after this. Hi, welcome back to Herd Tell Show. You know we always end on kind of a happy note. Maybe this is happiness that falls from the sky. Literally, you know, we have our friend Dr. Michael Siegel on all the time. He's always talking about the asteroid that never seems to hit Earth but makes lots of headlines. Well, this one's a little different. Dad uh, from the New York Post. Dad finds meteorite worth $130,000 in a farmer's field. Now, let's have a little disclaimer. of Don't try this at home. If you are in a farmer's field and you're not used to being on a farm or in the country, be very careful what kind of rock you pick up may not be a rock. Nevertheless, uh, from the New York Post, a dad has found a two-pound, four-ounce meteorite worth up to $130,000 in a farmer's field after searching for it for 18 months. Tom Widling, 38, of Wexham, North Wales, began his hunt after a ball of flame shot over his home and went out. Tony is hopeful to get to rock certified to find out how much it's worth. He said, I was in my back garden having a midnight cigarette when I noticed the sky lighting up above my head. Hopefully this is actual meteorite and it's not because of what he was lighting up, but I digress. Uh, I looked, this is a quote, I looked up to see a low flying ball of fire with two swirling trails of smoke. It got brighter as it approached my house at about twice its height. It was so low you could have kicked a football in the air and it would have reached it. As it crossed over it, if it extinguished within a few seconds, there was no noise. It just disappeared, leaving only trails of smoke. There's a picture of this rock. We'll see if it turns out to be real or not, but supposedly, if it's the real deal meteorite, may be worth six figures for this feller who was just out getting a smoke. Or maybe he made the whole thing up and he was just smoking something really good. You never can tell these days. Either way, good for him. That'll do it for Herd Tell. Thank you so much for all of your support. If you're watching this either on the YouTube or the Big Talker Network Facebook page, we sure appreciate it. If you're listening on any of the podcasting platforms, even better. Appreciate y'all as well. If you're listening live on Big Talker Network, uh, the Big Talker Network partnership is something we treasure. Our buddies TK Yala Elsowski does the back end stuff on that. The new app is getting ready to launch. Uh, you can listen live on their webpage and also their Facebook feed if you want to watch the show via Facebook. More importantly, you can share the show via Facebook. As soon as the show is over, those go to archive. You can pull them up on the video page anytime you want and share them. You can comment on them. We do see those comments. Happy to hear back from you. If you're on the YouTube page or the podcasting platforms, please make sure you subscribe. Uh, subscribe to both. Those aren't uh, mutually exclusive. Love to have you along. That way you don't miss anything. You get Herd Tell every weekday morning. You'll get the Good Talks interview segments every afternoon. Every time we do a long-form podcast, there's over 36 of those now uh, in the back archive. You can get those when we do deep dives on certain subjects. And twice on Sunday, that's the clip show, all five interviews from the previous week, every Sunday, twice on Sunday, which is also being streamed on Big Talker Network on Sundays, daily on Big Talker Network, 6 a.m., replay at 3 p.m., and of course, anytime on the other platforms. So appreciate you folks. Make sure you leave a comment and rating if you're given the option to do so. And if you really want to do us a solid, Share us on your social media. Uh, we don't do any advertising here other than word of mouth and social media. And that has given us great growth because you folks believe in this little program. You like what we're doing and we love doing it for you. And as long as you keep listening and watching, we're going to continue to do it. So for the end of this week, until we see y'all on Monday, we hope you have a great weekend wherever you and yours are across the street or around the world. We hope you are well. We hope you are well fed. Can't wait to see you again on Monday, right here on Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs... Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.